so yeah, I didn't know what I wanted to study. Uh, well, really, I, I guess I didn't know what I wanted to get in debt for. And so I decided to go travelling instead um, after doing uh, one year of music event management at Mainz. And I went and got a job working at Glastonbury uh, Music Festival and basically all of the kind of festivals in the Southwest circuit for two years. And uh, that's seasonal work. And it was amazing because I love kind of anything that brings people together for shared, you know, experiences of happiness and joy, and I think that's a really, really good thing. Um, and I also really love music, um, but I can't play music, so I figured I'd organise the musicians because they're not usually very organised. Nice. Um, and uh, that's seasonal work. So in the rest of my day, I ended up uh, falling into a role as a charity fundraiser. And so charity fundraising was kind of my first end to the kind of space of social change in the world of NGOs. And the reason I put these two pictures up here is because I think they kind of like embody my kind of being as a whole, which is that I really want to make the world a better place, but I want to like wear onesies and go surfing while we do it, because um, I think it's really important to have fun while you're trying to make the world a better place as well. Um, cool. So my theory of change explained in fish, and I'm sorry if you've seen me present before, because I always use these fish, but it just sums up everything that I think. So right now, uh, the world kind of looks a little bit like this, and all of the big problems are that big fish, which is kind of like inequality and climate change and poverty and uh, privacy and mass surveillance and all of these kind of horrible things, and it's kind of winning. And uh, that's because people don't really know how to make effective change in a really kind of strategic way, in my view. Um, and that's because, you know, information overwhelm and lots of things going on in our lives, just trying to make ends meet, so on and so on. So really what we need to do is we, know that we need to get more organised so that we can take on the big fish like this. So that's kind of my, my whole theory of change. And so how I practice my theory of change explained in emojis is through my day-to-day -day work with Action Station. And Action Station I actually find really hard to explain to people uh, who, don't, who aren't the kind of people who wouldn't, wouldn't come to an event like this, right? I find it really hard to explain to my nana what I do for a living and I'm sure many of you have experienced this sort of thing as well. Um, so this is, this is the most succinct version of what I do in my day to day life, which is basically using digital tools uh, to amplify the voices of lots of awesome people who combine their money and their voice and their actions and their creativity and their skills to create a better world. So Action Station was basically launched about 18 months ago. I'm a founding staff member at Action Station. Uh, more than 120,000 people have taken part in our campaign since we launched. We've run 45 campaigns in those 18 months. Uh, roughly a third of those have been partially or fully successful. Um, and th these are kind of the three core components to our model and the kind of way that we make change happen. One, we are first and foremost member driven, <clears throat> which means that our members set the course of our campaigns. They do that in a number of different ways. We send out surveys to our members regularly to ask what it is that they care about. Based on those responses, we will launch campaigns. Uh, we test full campaigns, so we actually set up campaign pages, remembering that these are online campaigns. We will actually set up campaign pages and we'll send it out to a segment of our list, see what the kind of data produces from that, whether or not people are interested, and if, it, if there are a lot of people that were interested, we'll take that to a wider segment of the list. We kind of consider that a form of digital listening. Uh, so our member-driven kind of model is a mixture of data and intuition. Uh, the essential service that we offer uh, to people that we're trying to pull out of that data and intuition is helping them to basically combine the resources to make the world a better place. And that member-driven principle also means that our goal is to be 100% member-funded eventually. And that is um, because we should only be beholden to our community. Uh, the community should ultimately feel ownership and responsibility over the campaigns. But also it does give us a lot of kind of political strength. It allows us to remain independent and speak out when a lot of other organisations who are government funded, for instance, aren't able to speak out. We can kind of do more of that work. So we don't take money from corporations, from government, um, from lottery grants, but that does make it incredibly hard for us to be financially sustainable, as you can probably imagine. The second one is we use digital tools, but we are not an online organisation. So we are a campaigning community that uses digital tools to enhance our campaign work. Tech is a really crucial tool. We invest in it early and we invest in it uh, in, in maximising our in-house capacity. Um, although we are, to be honest, still three or four years behind the corporate world, which is a really big problem. Um, but it is only a tool. We only use tool for its impact. And we don't assume that our members are particularly technically savvy. So we try and make those tools as easy to use as possible. In fact, most Action Station members are like 55 plus year old women. Um, <clears throat> so they're not kind of digital natives like me. <coughs> uh, 
Ultimately, the tech element of our work should try and be invisible, um, and it really should be the voices of our members that shine through. That's the ultimate goal. Uh, and thirdly, we are multi-issue, and that's largely because humans are multi-issue. Um, we organisations tend to think in kind of issue sectors, which I think is really important because you need those people to go deep. But people think more in kind of crises, opportunities, and values. So we act where there is a passion and potential for change based on that way that, that people think. And we try to match our focus in the outside world um, with, the, with, with the opportunities that exist for progressive change and where the energy is. Oh, I should have brought my water up. Okay, <clears throat> so the DNA that makes us up, this kind of, in this list, just looks like a bunch of buzzwords, so I'm, I apologise for that. But um, we, are, we, don't, we don't just do digital campaigning for any kind of values. We are progressive in our values, and progressive values... It was really similar to what Lila was saying, which is kind of like a gut check about whether or not you're sitting on the right side of history. There's no kind of litmus test for what we run our campaigns on. It's just kind of like, is this the right thing to be doing? Um, and obviously we didn't start off with a lot of members, so we had to launch campaigns that we thought would attract the kind of people that we needed who would then pick the kinds of campaigns that we should run on in the future, if that makes sense. So it's a kind of bit of the chicken and the egg thing going on there. We are grassroots, which means that we are all by and for the people. We are a people-powered organisation, and we believe in an outside of, uh, outside of, uh, sorry, outside of power theory of change, which means rather than having insider access, so making kind of concessions with a particular MP that will keep the door open to us so that we can sit at the negotiating table, we don't do that because they might be out the next time around. We rely on building people power and constituencies and making sure they're really powerful. Although I think insider access is important as well. For other groups. Uh, we are responsive, so as I said, we are digital listeners, we use data and intuition to drive our campaigns, but we also have regular retrospectives internally as an organisation, so every week we meet and we talk about what worked and what didn't last week so that we can make it better the next week, so it's very iterative the way that we operate. We are independent, as I've already mentioned. Um, we are nimble, which means that we, we chase the energy. And that, what I mean by that is that's where high information meets high actionability. So it's the moments where media saturation has happened and people are talking about this thing and they need somewhere to, for that energy to go. We act like uh, the, 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 the um, what's, what would you call it? So we are basically like the, how do they say it? It's the cavalry and the infantry. So if you're not familiar with that kind of war terminology, which I wasn't when this was explained to me. Traditional groups are like the infantry, right? So they have relatively small numbers of highly committed activists and relatively large numbers of expert staff who fight for years and years and years to make change on a single issue. And that's really important. And then what we can do is we are the cavalry who can turn on a dime and mobilize people very, very quickly when that peak moment happens. So we do believe in those major change moments, which you kind of alluded to there. And one of the risks in this model is that people only remember that last surge of action, which is something that, as staff of Action Station, we really try hard not to do and not to kind of play in those wins in those spaces. So if you ever see us doing that, please call us out. Um, nimbleness also requires a low bureaucracy environment. So we have no hierarchy at Action Station. We have a distributed leadership model, and we all participate in making the decisions, um, which means that executioner and practitioner are the same thing, which means that we can do things very, very quickly. And that, I think, is our comparative advantage in the field of social change to other organisations. Um, we are full spectrum, so as I already mentioned at the beginning, we don't just want people's money so that we go off and do the work, we want their voice, their votes, their presence, their skills, their social networks, all of those kinds of resources. Uh, we are collaborative. Virtually every single campaign that we run is a collaboration. Thank you either with a member or a subject matter expert or another ally organisation, another civil society group. We really believe in the collective impact model, so we try and be collaborative in all of our campaigns. And we really foster a culture of innovation, um, and that largely comes down to the fact that we have low bureaucracy. Uh, low floor, high ceiling, for those of you that are familiar with the lingo, is basically that kind of engagement um, ladder. The low floor means that we count Action Station members as anyone who's ever taken any action with us, or more than two actions in a quarter. So that an action could be signing a petition, it could be writing a submission, it could be coming to a rally, it could be making a donation. Any of those kind of quite simple actions, all the way up to organising your own rally and having a house party and talking about the issues and those sorts of things. Our job is obviously to bring more people up to that high ceiling, but we will keep the barrier to entry really, really low. Um, <coughs> The last one is steward leadership, and this is, I, I think, one of the most important things because steward leadership 
means that we can't confuse the fact that we're member driven with no leadership at the top at all because we actually have a high responsibility to provide you know, excellent strategic guidance, skillful execution and high quality information to our members uh, who have given us their, basically their sacred trust to channel that energy that they've given us into something that actually creates the kind of change that they want to see. So um, that's a kind of, that's informed by trial and error largely and the experience of our sister organisations overseas and it never kind of ends. It also means sometimes we have to campaign on issues that our membership is kind of split on. So one of our biggest issues uh, that we've campaigned on is the TPPA, which has brought in a lot of people who are economic nationalists but not necessarily progressive. And so our other campaign, which is on refugees and welcoming more refugees into New Zealand, uh, we have a lot of tension between members there. So we have to do a lot of facilitation and conversation between those two groups because ultimately we think that these people aren't actually xenophobic or Islamophobic or anything like that. They just don't realise what is possible yet and they're fearful and we're trying to break down that fear. So a lot of what we do is kind of bring progressive members across the spectrum of issues. How much time do I have? Two and a half minutes. All right, cool. So three examples of um, the way that we run our campaigns. This is actually ours. This is Frontline Arts Collective and I just really like that picture because I thought it was really creative. So TPPA. Um, I'm gonna, this is to highlight our low floor, high ceiling and full spectrum style of campaigning. So everyone that has come into TPPA has come through signing a petition and we have about 56,000 people who have signed a petition of that, which is about 2.5% of the voting population in New Zealand, so it's not anything to kind of shrug off, I, I think. And they all started signing a petition, but since then have crowdfunded radio ads, a projector stunt, a fact website, attended rallies organised by It's Our Future, sent tens and thousands of emails to MPs, made phone calls and had meetings. So that's the kind of low floor, high ceiling, full spectrum stuff. Steward leadership, refugees, as I've already kind of mentioned, but also that was capturing the energy. So we actually launched a refugee petition a long time ago. I think it was in January last year. And it had about 2,000 people for a long time until that really tragic picture went viral and then it jumped to like 15,000 all of a sudden. So we were there ready to have something that people could point there, some, something that people could do because people were feeling so horrible at that time. So we had something there ready to go. Um, since then, you know, people have sent emails to Michael Woodhouse, uh, they've created a crowdsourced video, they've crowdfunded, so that's the low floor high ceiling once again. And collaborative, our last one down here is Marianne, the, the, um, uh, my colleague at Action Station. We work with uh, Child Poverty Action Group, UNICEF, and the New Zealand Council of Christian Social Services to make child poverty a budget issue last year, and that helped it increase a uh, that helped secure an increase in core benefit levels, albeit with a lot of horrible trade-offs. Um, but it was the first time that that had happened in like 30 or so years, and we were able to kind of take what was usually kind of research-based report pieces into kind of policy change in the real world. The gaps in this theory of change. Um, there are a few. Uh, Short-term ca short campaigns with quick wins risks winning battles but losing the war. We might save the tree in Western Springs, but does that mean we're really defeating the neoliberal agenda? Um, we could be fostering a culture of collectivism where people think that just signing a petition is enough. Um, but like I say, we try and bring people up the engagement ladder to avoid this. Reliance on outrage in media cycles can feed a sense of hopelessness and overwhelm, which is something that we don't really want to feed for long-term social change. And it is one of our strategic goals this year to change the narrative from hopelessness to hope, so I'll let you know the next theories of change will be on that wind. Um, hard to become financially sustainable and that we cover a lot of issues, but it doesn't mean we go very deep on the issues. But again, I say that we try and mitigate that by partnering with people who are experts and do go deep on the issues. Um, this is my final slide and I'm just going to leave you with this quote because I've just been reading Strategy and Soul and I thought that this was really, really great because um, our whole kind of theory is about moving the rock and not necessarily moving the balloon. Thank you. <laughs>